women. Um, a lot of that has to do with menopause, not all of it, um, but that's my specialty. I'm also a certified sexual counselor. Um, so I have some extra training in counseling and extra training in sexual problems in women. So I'm really happy to be here to talk to you all about intimacy after breast cancer because that is so important to quality of life. Yet when we're going through that cancer journey, it's all about getting rid of the cancer. So, whoops, actually, I don't have this on. Hold on, I got to put it on the, the slideshow. Okay, there we go. All right. So these are my disclosures. I love to talk. So I'm a, I'm a speaker for some drug companies. So what if somebody told you that you could never have pleasurable sex again? Well, if anybody ever told you that, you can just knock that out of the woods because despite breast cancer, you can have pleasurable sex again. And we're gonna go through all the different things that we can do for certain things that happen when you have breast cancer. So sex is good for you, no brainer, you all know that. It enhances intimacy, it actually helps decrease pain and it increases happiness by releasing endorphins, which are your natural painkillers. When you have sex, uh, your brain releases oxytocin. This is that bonding and cuddle hormone, um, kind of like you release oxytocin when you have a baby, so you bond with your baby, you can bond with your partner. Um, sex can be a workout. It improves cardiovascular health and stamina, and it burns calories, um, which I think is great because women who have breast cancer tend to gain weight instead of lose weight, which I personally think is just unfair. Um, so the goal of this talk is to really make sure that you know that there are treatments for sexual problems in women with breast cancer, that you don't have to just grin and bear it or suck it up. There are definitely things you can safely do. So we'll talk a little bit about how breast cancer in particular affects intimacy. And then my talk is really going to focus on low libido and painful sex, because those are by far the two biggest things or two biggest side effects um, of cancer treatment that I see in my practice. And when I didn't mention, my practice is at St. Luke's in Chesterfield, um, which is outside of St. Louis, obviously. So um, I am coming to you with this talk wearing two hats. As I mentioned, um, I am a breast cancer survivor myself. So I've been through it, done that, it's miserable. Like I said, hope I never have to do that again. So I look at this not only from the physician standpoint, but also from the patient standpoint. So what happens when you get that cancer diagnosis, right? Like your world turns upside down. And at least in my mind, I have my life before cancer and the day I found out and then my life after cancer. Um, and I sort of segment my life in that way, but it really does just turn your world upside down. And so we kind of go through these stages after diagnosis. You get your diagnosis, all of a sudden it's all about got to see this doctor, got to see that doctor. You, you seriously meet with so many different people. Um, like it's just all about getting rid of that cancer. And so then you go into your like treatment, right? You have so many things you have to do, whether it's surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and then it's all over and you get on with your life. You might have gotten put on some uh, anti-estrogens um, or adjuvant therapies. These are the medicines that you stay on. We'll talk about them as you, you know, get on with the rest of your life. And a lot of those can wreak havoc on your sex life. So breast cancer is very common. Um, this, uh, this data point, the estimated new cases uh, in 2020 is 279,100. I mean, breast cancer occurs in one in eight women. So, you know, if, it, if we didn't have it, we know people who have it. So it's super, super common. And the good news is that over the years, um, the treatment for breast cancer has gotten so much better, hooray. Um, and that means that many more women are going to be survivors and lead the rest of their life. So that survivorship and quality of life becomes so important to so many women. So intimacy problems are really common in cancer patients. So you can see here some of the common problems that women with breast cancer have. Low desire, problems with arousal or lubrication, difficulty with orgasm, pain with sex, body image concern, 
or poor nipple sensation or no nipple sensation. And I find that that's one thing that people don't realize before they have their surgery, that especially with a mastectomy, you may have no sensation. And in fact, you might have numbness in your chest. Um, and we don't, do a, we don't do a lot of talking about that in advance. And sexuality is really important to cancer survivors. So um, in this Live Strong survey, sexual function ranked as the third most common concern for cancer survivors. So it's right up there. So, you know, once we finish our treatment, we have to find our new normal. I find that some people hate the term new normal. Some people love the term new normal. I feel like I have to be careful when I say it because I don't want to make anybody upset with it. I personally love the new normal. And somebody pointed out to me that even without breast cancer, as time goes on, you have a new normal. That's just true for everybody. So I kind of like to think about it that way. But there's definitely physical changes and psychological changes that happen once you've been diagnosed and gone through treatment. And these things happen and they can affect your sexual function. So my kind of mantra when it comes to sexuality, and this is sort of a hard one, right? Because when you get diagnosed, you're like, why me? You're really sad, you're really depressed. Then you go through an anger phase. Why me? Why did I get this? And, and you don't, in the beginning especially, don't wanna accept it. Um, but there are plenty of things that you can do and you can change to make sure you have a happy and healthy sex life because everybody deserves that. And there are certain things that you can't change no matter what you do. And so I feel like, you know, over time it becomes change what you can and accept what you cannot. So um, as far as things that happen, um, cancer related issues, um, several things happen with breast cancer. There are anatomical changes from surgery, whether or not you have a lumpectomy or a mastectomy, breasts are considered sex organs. So that can really sort of wreak havoc on your sex life chemotherapy. Let me see if I have a couple things in here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anatomical changes from surgery. Chemotherapy causes a, a lot of trouble. It can throw you into the menopause. If you were having periods before, now you're not having periods. You have terrible hot flashes. Um, mucous membrane irritation. So mucous membranes include the mouth and the vagina. You need your mouth to kiss and the vagina you need for sex. You might be nauseated, throwing up, exhausted, losing your hair. All of these things do not put you in a sexy mood, right? Definitely not. Radiation can cause a loss of normal sensation, some skin thickening, discoloration. Some partners are worried that maybe you're radioactive. So, you know, and, and it makes it hard, like range of motion difficulties with your arms. So all of these little things that we might take for granted now become an issue. And then there are several post-treatment medications that can affect your sex life. So the two biggest groups of medications that affect your sex life are one, the antidepressants, who isn't depressed after a cancer diagnosis. And a lot of the antidepressants that we commonly use, like Zoloft, Paxil, Prozac, um, we use them for depression or we use some in the same group for hot flashes. So Effexor we use for hot flashes, Paxil we use for hot flashes, and that whole group of medicines, which are called SSRIs or SNRIs, um, they lower your libido and they make it more difficult to reach orgasm. The other thing that we do with breast cancer patients is if you have an estrogen sensitive cancer, we block every last drop of estrogen, which is great to prevent the cancer from coming back, but not so kind to your sex life and to the vagina. So aromatase inhibitors, these are the medicines like Arimidex, Letrozole, they lower your estrogen level even lower than the normal postmenopausal range. They work by preventing estrogen uh, synthesis in fat cells. So fat cells make estrogen, your ovaries make estrogen. Um, once your ovaries aren't working anymore, we tend to put you on an aromatase inhibitor because then we, that blocks your fat cells from making any estrogen. Tamoxifen works a little bit differently. It blocks the receptors for estrogen. So estrogen floats around in your blood, it binds to a cell via a receptor and exerts whatever it's gonna cause that cell to do. Tamoxifen blocks that. So estrogen can't 
hook on to a breast cancer cell and make it grow. Lupron and Zolodex basically throw you into the menopausal state and menopause is not kind to the vagina. So like I said, we're gonna really focus on painful sex, low libido, and we'll talk a little bit about the importance of body image and sexual self-esteem. So one take home message that I think is really important is that if you are having issues with your sex life, ask your provider about your symptoms. Now you might say, well, which provider? And it depends where you are. Um, here in St. Louis, um, I work really closely with the Siteman Cancer Center. Um, the, the oncologists there know about me. They're happy to give you a referral. Um, I also know very well the people at SLU. Um, so in St. Louis, I think it's easy to, to ask to get a referral, to, to know who to ask about your sexual problems. But physicians with extra training in sexual health are not that common and if you're in a location where you know you the cancer center isn't tied in closely with a gynecologist with that training it might be hard to find somebody to listen to your problems or to have an answer for you because many providers if they 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 just don't know if they don't have an answer they may not want to talk about it so if you are listening to this from somewhere else um, you can go to the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, or ISWSH, I-S-S-W-S-H, and there's a list of providers who, um, who manage sexual symptoms. So anybody in the United States, anybody in Europe for that matter, can all over the world, you can find somebody with that extra training and extra knowledge. Because what, what bothers me the most is when patients come to me and they say, oh, well, I saw my doctor. My doctor said, sorry, you just have to live with it. Or uh, have a glass of wine, it'll make you feel better. And you're like, no, no, that's not the answer. So there is help. So I'm first going to talk about genitourinary syndrome of menopause, which is basically vaginal dryness um, due to menopause. So, you know, breast cancer survivors sometimes have their ovaries removed, which puts them into the menopause or chemotherapy puts them into the menopause, or maybe they were menopausal in the first place. So let's talk about what happens with, we call it GSM. It's also called vaginal atrophy, but it doesn't have as pretty of a ring to it. One thing I want to say, let me see, no, I don't have it in here, but there are a couple changes that happen to the vagina when you go through menopause. So premenopausally, the vaginal tissue is thick and it's moist and it stretches. When there's estrogen around, the vagina stretches and it self lubricates. When the estrogen goes away, the vaginal tissue becomes thin and dry and it doesn't stretch, it doesn't lubricate and sex hurts. So that's the number one thing that uh, women with breast cancer run into. And it typically doesn't happen, um, you know, if you were premenopausal with your diagnosis, it doesn't happen immediately. It takes some time to happen. And so many women won't realize that that has to do with the lack of estrogen, um, but it does. So I think it's important to, to know that um, you're not crazy. It doesn't mean you don't love your partner because things are dry. It's just that lack of hormones in the vagina causes vaginal dryness. So there are many options for treatment. Um, we usually start with the, you know, no-brainer lubricants and moisturizers, and then we move on to other options. So I'm going to run through all of your options. Um, I'll start with lubricants and moisturizers. Sorry. So, um, there, so lubricants are for use at the time of sex. So you don't have to use them on a regular basis. Um, if you are not using condoms, you should throw away your water-based lubes. The water-based lubes draw moisture out of the vaginal tissue. Um, so we recommend, or I recommend, using a either a silicone-based lubricant or something like olive oil. Um, the silicone-based lubricant that I like is Uber Lube. There's plenty of other ones. Um, Uber Lube you can get on the internet. We also have it in my office. Um, ones that I've seen at like Walgreens CVS, there's one called Platinum Wet. 
Astroglide makes a silicone based one. So I know it sounds like a chemical and it's a chemical is kind of scary once you've been through cancer. Water based sounds so much better, but it's actually not. So you want to choose silicone based or the olive oil you use to make a cell liquid that works just fine too. Moisturizers are to be used on a regular basis. So just like, you know, you wash your hands and you put a pump of Vaseline intensive care and you put it on your hands to moisturize it, you can do that with the vagina too. Um, there are a variety of moisturizers on the market. Um, there are a couple different ones that I like. Um, there's one called Reverie, which is hyaluronic acid. I think that one works very well. There's one called Lubrigine, which you can buy on the internet, and there's one called Rosebud. And I know this is gonna sound funny, but that Rosebud smells like roses, and I just like the smell. And so I have some samples of Rosebud. You, it's also like a good lip moisturizer. Okay, call me crazy. I know that's weird, but it smells so good. Or you can use coconut oil. So, you know, no chemicals, just the coconut oil you get at Trader Joe's or at the supermarket. And then you might ask, well, how do I do that? What's the, how much do I put in? What do I do? So um, basically, there's no right or wrong answer to that. You sort of use as much as you need. If you use too much, you're gonna feel greasy and gross. If you don't use enough, you won't feel a difference. So you can maybe take some on your finger in the morning and night, put it sort of you know, around the inner lips, which are the labia, the inside of the small lips where most people feel very dry or kind of towards the bottom. Um, many women feel uncomfortable there. Um, you don't have to do it just morning and night. You can do it every time you go to the bathroom. You can pee, pat dry, and then put a little bit of coconut oil or whatever where you feel the most dry. Um, some people will take chunks of coconut oil and freeze them. And then you can take that coconut oil and just push it into the vagina and then it melts. And that way you get it up into the vagina. Whereas when it's not solid, it's hard to kind of push it all the way up there. As far as lubes go, you want to put some in your hand, put some on the outside of you, which is the vulva, the outside of the vagina, and put some on your partner's penis. And lubricants help with friction. They just help things glide more easily. A couple of years ago, there was a study looking at osmolality and pH, here's the pH one, of some of the most common lubes and moisturizers. And basically the take home point of this study is that if you have to use a water-based one because you're using condoms, although you can use Uber Lube with condoms, so you you don't really ever need a water-based. You want to choose one with very low osmolality because it's that osmolality, it doesn't even matter what it really means, it just draws moisture out of the cells. And you want to pick a lube or a moisturizer that matches the vaginal pH, which naturally is a little bit acidic. Um, so you want to go more towards the acidic range. When you go through menopause, the pH of the vagina gets more basic. So if you're going to put something in there, you want it to go back to that acidic range. So lubricants and moisturizers do great to decrease the friction, but they don't improve the elasticity of the vagina and they don't bring blood flow to the vagina. So hormones do that, vaginal hormones, or vaginal laser can do that too, and we'll talk about those. All right, so what's the deal with using vaginal hormones, right? We totally hear the word hormones, scared half to death. Everybody's told you never touch another hormone in your entire life, they're evil, they caused this in the first place, which that's the jury's still out on. Um, but what do we know about vaginal hormones? So the first thing that I wanna say is when you use vaginal hormones, they're low dose, they don't get absorbed into the bloodstream in appreciable amounts, some more than others, which I'll show you. Um, but basically, there's a lot of studies out there and all of our big national organizations have looked at the data for you so you don't have to look at it and so I don't have to read every single study about it and they come up with a recommendation or an opinion. So ACOG is the American College of OBGYN. 
And basically what they did is that they looked at all the data, all the research studies, there's a lot of data out there, and they say data do not show an increased risk of cancer recurrence among women currently undergoing treatment for breast cancer or those with a history of breast cancer who use estrogen to relieve urogenital symptoms. Urogenital just means vulva, vagina, bladder symptoms, and things like that. So that's very reassuring. Um, ASCO is the, uh, it's something like the American Society of Clinical Oncologists. This is the, um, the main group for the oncology doctors. They also looked up the data and came up with some recommendations. Um, and their recommendations are try everything else first, lubricants and moisturizers. You might have to use moisturizers a lot of times a day. And if that doesn't work, so basically for those who don't respond to those or whose symptoms are really severe when they show up, low dose vaginal estrogen can be used. So what I mean by low dose is you're, nobody's ever gonna give you a pill of estrogen to swallow. That's a much higher dose or a patch. Can't do that. But the amount of estrogen that is in the vaginal preparations is so tiny that that like ACOG said, it hasn't been shown to increase the risk that your cancer would come back. So ASCO says you can consider that after you try lubricants, moisturizers, or if your symptoms are really severe. There's another product out there. It's called Intrarosa. That's the trade name. The generic name is Prasterone. Um, and what that is, it's a little suppository that goes in the vagina. Um, it's DHEA, which is a brother to um, estrogen and testosterone. And in the vaginal cell itself, it gets converted to estrogen and testosterone without making the blood levels go up a lot. Um, so people who use the intrarosa, the blood levels of hormones stay in the normal postmenopausal range. So according to ASCO, they say you can also offer vaginal DHEA, especially in women on aromatase inhibitors, and I'll show you why in a little bit, or you can choose a medicine called ospemaphine. Uh, its trade name is Osfina. And what that is, is it's an estrogen blocker at some tissues, but it acts like estrogen at other tissues. So lucky for us, it's a blocker in the breast, but it acts like estrogen in the vagina. It's not one of my favorites because it makes hot flashes really, really bad. It can increase your risk of blood clot, just like estrogen can. Um, but low dose vaginal estrogen, by the way, if I didn't mention this, very important, these vaginal preparations do not increase the risk of blood clot, breast cancer, heart attack, or stroke at all. So you can throw away the idea that hormones are dangerous. The vaginal ones really do not do any of that. And then there's the North American Menopause Society who basically says the same thing. Non-hormonal therapy should be tried first. If those don't work, you consider local hormones. Um, so how much estrogen is really absorbed? So this is sort of an old study. It looked at a couple different estrogen preparations. The take home method is that you can see in the pink box, less than 10 is normal postmenopausal range. They're all pretty much less than 10 except for the femring, which we would never use in a breast cancer patient because that's for hot flashes. It's more systemic. So all of the ones that we have really don't get absorbed to an appreciable amount. Um, the tablet is absorbed the least, then the ring, then the cream is absorbed the most. There's also a medicine called Invexi, which is genius marketing because it sounds like I'm sexy. They have a little soft gel capsule, it's the Invexi, and they have two doses of it. They have a four microgram dose, which is the lowest possible dose of vaginal estrogen you can get and still see a difference, or a 10 microgram dose. And you can see here those levels of hormones in your blood, which is what we care about, never get higher than the normal postmenopausal range. I talked about this already, the intravaginal DHEA, or also known as intrarosa. There is one study where they looked at intravaginal DHEA in women on aromatase inhibitors, and they checked their estrogen levels in their blood, and they didn't rise. Um, that just shows the numbers, which really aren't that interesting. So basically, when I see somebody, I go through all of the risks, benefits, and side effects of all of the options, and then my patients can choose what they're most comfortable with. 
So I'm going to turn now to vaginal laser procedure. So you might have heard about this as vaginal rejuvenation. Vaginal rejuvenation is more of a marketing term. It encompasses a lot of different types of devices. Um, so I'm really going to hone in on just the laser because that's where we have information about using it for postmenopausal women. So what does a laser do? Basically, the technology for the vaginal laser came from what we know about the laser for the face. So when you get like laser treatment from your dermatologist because you wanna look younger, um, what it does is it breaks down, the little laser beam breaks down the old collagen and then your body builds new and better collagen. And so somebody got the crazy idea to try it in the vagina, that happened in Italy. And um, what they did in some of the very early studies is they did a biopsy of the vaginal tissue before the laser and a biopsy after the laser. And so what you can see here, this layer right here is the layer that makes moisture. And this is before the laser. After the laser, this is all the cells that are gonna make that lubrication so you don't feel so dry. So the, there's a variety of different lasers that are available, the fractional CO2 laser, the YAG laser, there's really, for you, there's not, I mean, they, they both basically do the same thing. It's just the medium that the laser beam goes through, but there's a lot of information out there um, on the internet. So you do have to be careful and not always believe everything you read. So how does the laser work? You can see here, it almost looks like an ultrasound probe. Um, it goes in the vagina and it shoots a little laser beam. Whoops, sorry for that little teether. Um, and many physicians will do this without any anesthesia and most women tolerate it just fine. I usually give a woman some lidocaine to put in the vagina just to numb it up a little bit before we do the procedure. Um, for most women, just this needs to be done. Sometimes you can do the laser kind of in the labia minora and the labia majora too, just to, I hate to use the word rejuvenate, but just to rejuvenate the tissues. So there are studies looking at the effects of laser in breast cancer survivors. Um, and you can see here that these are their symptoms of vaginal dryness, vaginal itching, dyspareunia means painful sex, reduce sensitivity during sex. That's a huge deal. Some men, when they go through menopause, because there's just less blood flowing to the vagina, it won't quite be painful, but they say, I just don't feel anything anymore. So you can see this is before laser, this is after laser, before laser, after laser, all of these things improved. Sex got better, the itching burning got better, and the dryness got better. There is nothing without risk. Every medicine has risks, benefits, and side effects. Every procedure has risk, benefit, and side effects. Um, for the laser, mild to moderate pain. You might have some minor bleeding. You might have mild irritation of the introitus, um, but really it's a pretty low risk procedure, all external. Um, as far as the history of the laser, so let me talk a little bit about the history of the laser. So this technology has only been around since about 2012. And I've been doing sexual medicine for a long time. I've seen how things have kind of gone along. So at first the laser comes out, people started using them, people started buying them. They are FDA cleared, which means you as a physician can use a laser in a vagina. It's FDA cleared, but it's not FDA approved for treatment of genitourinary syndrome of menopause. There are many small studies, small studies, not great studies. They don't all have a placebo group, which is important when you do studies. So over time within the sexual medicine world, there's been kind of this battle. People are doing it because it's a non-hormonal option to treat genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Other providers are saying you should be doing that because we don't have enough data yet. And, and so I've seen this like clash of forces along the way. But over time, we're getting more and more data, more and more information about the laser. It's still not FDA approved in the United States, although you can use it because it's FDA cleared. But Canada just got it, their equivalent to, the, to our FDA. Um, Health Canada approved it for treatment of both vaginal dryness due to menopause and also for stress urinary incontinence. So that's like, a mild, mild uh, to moderate uh, stress urinary incontinence. That's like people who leak urine with a cough or a sneeze. 
So I'm really excited about it. And basically the point of these studies is just that, you know, the laser, the blue one, it does work. Things do improve. Um, almost in this trial, almost as good as estrogen, which is orange. And this one is laser and estrogen both. Um, in this trial, basically, they found that the vaginal laser, the non-hormonal vaginal laser treatment works just as well as vaginal estrogen. Don't get lasers confused with radio frequency. Radio frequency has, um, is more used for vaginal laxity, women who feel like the vagina is just too loose after childbirth. Um, radio frequency is um, a better choice for that. So in 2018, the FDA came out and said this vaginal rejuvenation treatment may be unsafe. Um, but when you look into that, it was more that there was some false advertising going on around vaginal rejuvenation. And if you went to some of those websites, it would tell you that a laser, that radio frequency, these vaginal rejuvenation treatments fix everything. Well, nothing does that. So this is what I mentioned that um, Health Canada looked at the data as we've gotten more and more and approved the um, laser for the vagina. So I'm really, really excited about that. Okay, so one other thing I wanna talk about now is pelvic floor muscle spasm, because what happens, uh, let me just look at the time here, okay, hopefully I can stay late and answer questions. Um, but anyway, what happens to um, women who have pain during sex, whether it's due to dryness from breast cancer and menopause or something else, when sex hurts, your natural inclination is to tense up the pelvic floor. So what is this picture here? This is, these are like your pelvic bone, right? Like when you think of a skeleton, the pelvic girdle, those muscles. And if you're looking down into it, what you don't see when you see a skeleton in your science class is there's this whole set of muscles, excuse me, this, all these muscles right here, this is the pelvic floor. So it's what all of your organs are sitting on top of so they don't fall out. But you can see here, that's the vagina. And the vagina is just a long hollow tube that goes up to the uterus. And it's surrounded by these pelvic floor muscles. So when sex hurts, women tense up those muscles, which makes it hurt even more. So sometimes we end up treating the vaginal dryness, we pick a lube or a moisturizer, we do laser or use estrogen, but they still have pain. And so then you have to think maybe there's some pelvic floor muscle spasm going on. And the, the best treatment for that is pelvic floor physical therapy. So some of you might have already gone to pelvic floor physical therapy who knew there was a physical therapist for the vagina, but there is and they're excellent. They have extra training in pelvic floor. So typically, physical therapy, first-line treatment. If that doesn't work, sometimes we'll use intravaginal Valium. So you can take a Valium pill. Don't try this without your doctor supervising, but you can take a Valium pill and put it in the vagina. Um, so you can do this 5 to 10 milligrams nightly or one hour prior to intercourse. Um, if it doesn't dissolve well, you can have it specially compounded. For some people, it doesn't dissolve. Other things we do are Botox into the pelvic floor or um, a muscle relaxer. Cyclobenzaprine is Flexerol. But many times we go, if physical therapy isn't enough, we go to vaginal dilators. So these are vaginal dilators and they're not so much for vaginal dilation. They can di dilate the vagina and especially the vaginas you use it or lose it. So if you've gone 10 years without sex, the vagina is gonna be smaller and shorter not as wide, you can dilate with vaginal dilators. But we also use these to desensitize, meaning that if you think it's gonna hurt, it's gonna hurt. So, you know, and it gives you also the confidence to try and have sex if it's been a while. You just put the dilator in the vagina, let it sit there, and then it sends signals to your brain and you're like, okay, doesn't hurt, doesn't hurt. So you're retraining your brain that you can have something in the vagina without pain. Talked about vaginal Valium. Um, Botox prevents pelvic floor muscle contraction, so it just relaxes them, but it also has pain properties. I didn't know that until kind of recently, but it does. And you can do this in the office or you can do it in the operating room. The last thing I wanna talk about is this uh, collision dyspareunia. And like I said, dyspareunia is painful sex. What that happens is, you know, it's, 
you'll see what I mean in here in a second. So when somebody has a smaller vagina or a painful vagina, then maybe they don't want their partner to go so deep. So what this does, this, these little rings here, they come apart, you put them on a man's penis. So the rings go here and they prevent him from going deep. Yet it still feels like he's in a vagina, but for the woman, it's not so darn painful. So these are awesome. You can buy them online. Um, or we have them in our office too. So let's turn to sex drive now. That's another thing that, that gets low with menopause or with lack of hormones. Um, basically, I just don't feel like having sex anymore. And it sounds like not a big deal, but it can be a very big deal to relationships. So just a little bit about the normal sexual response cycle, um, and I want to differentiate our old thinking from our new thinking, um, is that we used to think that sex always started with spontaneous desire. Out of the blue, you feel like having sex, right? Then you got aroused, then you reached orgasm, then there was a resolution. But we know that women are different from men, right? How women shop, how men shop, very, very, very different. So women have a more responsive desire. So in, this is all generalizations, not everybody, but women may not be thinking about sex. But if they're getting what they need in the relationship, whether it's you know a hug or a kiss or he took out the trash or she took out the trash, um, then you're dry, then you're a little bit more interested. So in general, sex drive in women doesn't always start out of the blue. And that's really important to keep in mind because many partners will say, you never initiate, don't you love me? And the woman says, of course I love you, but I'm just not thinking about it. And there are so many things that can affect a woman's sex drive. So not just cancer, but medications, pain, you always have to like treat, you always have to treat the pain first or libido is never going to improve, right? If sex hurts, it's just good judgment to not want to do it. Other things like depression, anxiety, prior sexual or physical abuse, conflict with religious or family values, lack of communication in your relationship. Sex drive is the most complicated thing to work on fixing. But the good news is this is where it becomes important to fix what you can and accept what you can't. So what can you fix? If you're depressed and you're on an antidepressant that is lowering your libido, then you can switch to one that doesn't do that. If you have communication problems, you can seek counseling. Um, you know, there's so many things that you can tune up that you can work on. Whereas maybe before the, the antidepressant, it wasn't enough to cause low libido, then you throw the cancer in there. Now it really is. So fix what you can and accept what you can't. So like I mentioned, adjust modifiable factors, medicines, behaviors, tune up medical problems. Uh, here's that same uh, list of medications that can cause sexual problems. We talked about the aromatase inhibitors, tamoxifen, Lupron. Oral contraceptive pills also do it. You're most likely not worried about that. Chemotherapy, then we talked about the SSRIs, SNRIs, Paxil, Prozac, Zoloft, Flexpro, Selexa, all those. And the good news is sex drive doesn't only have to do with testosterone, which you can't take. Um, it has a lot to do with several neurotransmitters and other hormones. So melanocortins, it has to do with dopamine, it has to do with prolactin, oxytocin. All of those are on limits for women with breast cancer. So just because you can't take testosterone doesn't mean you can't do something to improve your desire. And with this Venn diagram, the point I want to make here is it's all connected. You know, we talk about pain separately from talking about desire, but really if you have low desire, you might not be aroused, that might cause pain, you might have orgasm problems, they're all connected. Or you have pain, so you can't orgasm, you don't get aroused, and you have no desire. So they are hard to break apart. And then you might ask, should I even worry about sex when I should be grateful to be alive? And the answer clearly is yes. You absolutely should. So what can you do that's non-pharmacologic? We'll talk about that first. Um, we talked about arousal before desire already, but you can also nurture your relationship. We all get busy with our kids, our life, our work. Our partner goes to the bottom of the list. Make sure that you're not relegating that person to the bottom of the list, that you still have good communication, that you go out together, you find activities you enjoy together. I always recommend 
erotic reading. So there's erotic reading, there's erotic listening, and there's erotic watching. And it doesn't mean you're a bad person if you want to do any of that. Because basically what that does, if you're reading something sexy, it gets those neurons firing in your brain um, that think spontaneous sexual thoughts. So it's kind of like exercising your erotic brain. Here are some places you can find erotic reading. I also have a reading list that I give to my patients. And orgasm is important to improving drive. And that's sometimes something that goes away um, when you have breast cancer and a lack of hormones. So it becomes all that more important that your needs are met. Because when you have an orgasm, your brain releases hormones and neurotransmitters that say, wow, that felt good, let's do that again. All, like, and it releases dopamine, which is your reward center. So if you're really not getting anything out of the sexual experience, the next time it's presented to you, you'll be like, nah, I don't really feel like it. So it is important that you get your needs met. So part of that goes along with in order to want to have sex, it has to be sex worth wanting. Your needs have to be taken care of. So sex is selfish and selfless. I say that all the time. You do it because you love your partner. You want to please your partner, but you also need to be pleased. So what about medicines? Can't use hormones. So there are two medicines that are available that are non-hormonal. One is called Addy. That's its trade name. Flibanserin is the generic name. This was the first drug that was approved by the FDA for premenopausal women with HSDD. HSDD is a fancy term for low libido. Um, and, but it has been shown to work in postmenopausal women too. It's an off-label use. We use things all the time off-label. There is data to support its use in postmenopausal women. Um, and it affects the balance of neurotransmitters in your brain. So that one thing where I showed you that it wasn't all about testosterone, it affects the other things that control sex drive. And in the studies, improvements were seen in desire scores. They had questionnaires um, in numerous studies. It does take six to eight weeks to see an effect. It works about 50% of the time, according to the studies. But in my opinion, my patients like how they feel on it. It's not going to give you the sex drive of a 15-year-old boy. It's not going to make you a danger to leave the house. But it just makes you a little bit more interested, a little bit more receptive, more spontaneous sexual thoughts throughout the day. And it works through dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Contraindications to using Addy are um, you can't uh, drink a whole bunch and take your Addy, just like Percocet or Valium. You can't do that. If It used to be if you drank any alcohol at all, the FDA said no Addy. And that has changed. Now, um, if you take Addy, or if you drink, you have to wait two hours before you take your Addy. And then after you take your Addy, you have to wait eight hours until you can drink again. But most people go to sleep because its main side effect is drowsiness. Certain medicines interact with it. And if you have liver disease or liver failure, you can't use it. The other one is called Vilesi, which um, is the trade name. The generic name is Bremelanotide. And this one works through melanocortins in your brain. So true story, the way they found this drug is there were some researchers in Arizona trying to find a drug that would protect your skin from breast cancer by making you tan naturally without the UV radiation. But they found that that drug also had positive sexual side effects. So duh, they changed course decided not to go for the indication of, you know, decreasing your risk for melanoma and things like that, and go for the indication of improving sex drive. So it is FDA proof to improve sex drive also in premenopausal women. It hasn't really been studied in postmenopausal women, although I know several practitioners who do use it. We just don't have the data like we do for Addy yet because it's a newer drug. Um, let's see. The main side effects of it, nausea, flushing, headaches, you can get an injection site. Oh, it's an injection. I left that part off. Addie's a pill you take every night. Vilesi or bremelanotide is an injection that you use just when you want to have drive. So you don't have to take a medicine every day. Some people like that because they're like, I'm already on so many medicines. I don't want to add another to the mix. This is, it looks like an EpiPen. So you never see the needle. You just put it in your thigh. And then that increase in desire happens anywhere from an hour to several hours after you use it. And it lasts for up to 16 hours. 
And you can see from this that in their studies, this was uh, before Vilesi, this is after Vilesi. Oh, sorry, let me scratch that. This is placebo. Sorry, this is a placebo. People who didn't really get the Vilesi, they got like a fake one. Um, and this is the people who truly got by Lisi, and you can see their desire, whoops, you can see their desire was so much higher than the people who got the placebo. The last one I wanna talk about is bupropion, also known as Wellbutrin, um, also non-hormonal that has been shown to improve desire and orgasm. And it's, it's marketed as an antidepressant and you might recognize it from, it was in Zyban, which is a quitting smoking drug. Um, so you might think if you treat somebody's depression, their libido would improve, but there are studies that show that it improves libido even in patients who are not depressed. But if you're on tamoxifen, you can't take Wellbutrin because it interacts with tamoxifen. One more thing about bupropion. I'm a little partial to this drug for two reasons. In general, bupropion is also part of the medicine contrave, which is the weight loss medicine. I see a lot of women in my practice who want to lose weight, um, especially around the time of menopause, women start to gain weight. Antidepressants can cause you to gain weight. Um, there's lots of reasons that happens, lack of estrogen. Um, but bupropion is part of the weight loss medication called Contrave, and it helps with cravings, which is why it helps with stopping smoking. Addy has also been shown to cause, they weren't looking to see if it caused weight, but when they looked at the two groups, women on Addy tend to lose weight. Who doesn't want to lose weight? What about body image? So body image is a tough one because when you go through breast cancer, you all of a sudden have all these missing parts, right? You have an altered sexual self. You might not have breasts. Many times you get a hysterectomy and an oophorectomy and you might feel like what is left of me that's woman, like what is left? But you have plenty left to enjoy a healthy sex life. You have a vagina and you have a clitoris. And we don't often talk about the clitoris, but the clitoris is sort of where it's at um, for sexual pleasure. So, um, you know, most orgasms are from clitoral stimulation and up to 70% of women can't reach orgasm from vaginal penetration. So don't feel bad if you've never had one of those, but breast cancer doesn't doesn't you you haven't lost everything so you kind of have to take the you know glass half empty to the glass half full attitude and the other thing i feel like is cover it up if you don't like how you feel you don't want to be naked turn the lights off buy some sexy lingerie it's totally okay you do what you have to do it's your new normal um, and surgical treatment affects body image, right? Lumpectomy can leave some, you know, tugging or pulling or scars. Um, that's a no-brainer. So how do you reclaim your self-esteem? I mentioned some things, the sexy lingerie, but make yourself a priority. So as women, many times we go to the bottom of our list, even below our partner, because we might be working, we might have children, you know, we're the caregivers, we take care of everybody else. But when it comes to this, you got to make yourself a priority and it makes you a better mom, a better person at work, a better lover. Um, so make yourself a priority and love the parts that you have. I'll talk about exercise in a minute because you can feel good again. You can be this happy couple right here um, and you can have a good sex life again. It may not be the same, but that's true for everybody without breast cancer. As you age, things change. So you want to live healthy. Physical activity is so important. It helps with moods. It helps maintain your weight. It actually helps decrease the risk of recurrence of breast cancer. So no matter how much you hate exercise, get out there and do it. Maybe find a friend to make you accountable. Find something that you like to do. Even five minutes once a day or once a week is better than nothing. But physical activity is really important. Focus on a healthy diet. You don't have to be perfect. I'm a sugar, I'm a sweet tooth myself. Make sure you get adequate sleep. And I love yoga. So yoga helps with the pelvic floor, helps maintain core strength, helps build muscle strength and muscle burns more than fat. So you can help improve your metabolism to prevent that weight gain, which makes you feel sexier because if you gain a whole bunch of weight and women do around the time of breast cancer treatment, you're not going to feel sexy. Um, so there's so many benefits to yoga, physical activity, whatnot. Um, 
like I said, take what you have, make the most of it. Um, you know, I have had some, a patient tell me once that she always wanted to be a blonde. So when she went through cancer treatment, she bought a blonde wig and then she got to be a blonde that her partner had sex with. And it was sort of exciting and different, spice it up, role play, dress the part, be who you always wanted to be or not for good, but maybe you always wanted to try being somebody else. Try it out with your wig. And a good sex life adds 10 to 15% more value to a relationship, but a bad sex life can negatively impact a relationship by 50 to 70%. So a good sex life is pretty darn important and don't let anybody tell you it's not. So just to sum it up, breast cancer throws a wrench in your sex life. You don't have to accept it. Don't let somebody tell you, oh, well, there are several safe treatments and all women deserve a healthy sex life. So um, this is my contact information. Um, like I mentioned, I'm the director of the Evora Center for Menopause and Sexual Health. We're located at St. Luke's in Chesterfield. Um, this is our phone number to schedule and this is our um, website if you wanna check us out. I love social media. We're recording this because I'm going to put this on my YouTube channel. So if you have friends who want to listen or know anybody who wants to listen, my YouTube channel, you just search Dr. Becky Lynn. I also post interesting articles on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. My website has a blog and there are a couple articles there about sex after breast cancer. So you can find that under blog here. Um, and uh, I hope this was helpful. Thank you for listening. And I look forward to your questions.